Hi, welcome to the Mohua Show. My name is Mohua Chinappa and I am an author, entrepreneur and ex-housewife. This podcast is about everything from business to technology to arts to lifestyle but done and spoken imandari se. Hi, in this episode, we have with us Indian MTV VJ and TV host Maria Goretti Varsi. Maria, Maria has won hearts with her dynamic and versatile performances in various shows and movies. We are thrilled to have her here today with us to share her experiences, insights about her book. So, the first question, Maria, that I need to ask you is this: Tell us your journey about the entertainment industry and how you became an MTV VJ. What did it take for you to go there for that interview? Do you remember anything that you'd like to share with our listeners? when i was studying i really had no idea what i wanted to do in life i didn't know what profession i wanted to be in all i knew is that i did not want to be behind the desk which is really weird but because today i spend a lot of my time writing behind the desk <laughs> but uh, i i remember after i finished college i organically started doing ad films because i used to get called for them and uh, it's like one led to the other and uh, i started doing television i was hosting shows on z so all the english music based shows or i did a cookery show for them um so some somehow i got into hosting shows but i was still searching for uh, you know what i'm going to do in life um and my mom would keep asking me when am i going to get a job so um i never looked at it like this was a career because i was searching for my real career and in the middle of all this um i remember i had done uh, i had done a promo for mtv and uh, they called me and they said uh, one week before the vj hunt they called me and they said we having a vj hunt and why don't you uh, come and take part in it so i said when is the vj hunt they said it's next sunday so i was like but today is saturday and it's it's next sunday so you know haven't you all you know i was just looking at it and said and i could i knew the promos were going on for some time and i was like you know i'm sure they have their winner and they're just calling me as a filler and i i was very uncomfortable and i was like no but i didn't apply for this so i don't think i want to come for it and uh, they kept saying that no maria you should come because you know uh, it's going to be wonderful and uh, and i kept thinking i said no no this there's something off and why would they why would they call me when i have not applied you know because i remember seeing uh, if you want to be a vj you can send in your uh, videos and i had done no such thing so anyway i my spoke to my sister and she told me she said listen what do you have to lose it will be one week of hanging with really fun people and just go for it so i did i just went for a week of hanging with new people and making friends and i won the vj hunt my <laughs> god it just changed yeah it just changed everything i i did amazing so you know you actually went in when mtv's popularity in india was like really at its peak so you know was it competitive was it bitchy was it you know ego and all of that and how did you navigate if you were caught with the situation i think a lot of our listeners were youngsters and they all want to become you know like you and they want to go out there and seek the world out but lots of them are very frightened of what lay ahead do share with us some of the experiences so you know mahua when i joined mtv mtv india programming was just about changing which is why they hired indian faces indian voices indian youth so none of us there spoke with an accent before if you remember mtv used to have accented uh, firangi looking uh, or or mixed uh, mixed indian lives abroad so they came looking kind of indian but they were very western and they spoke with an accent well as we were the were a whole bunch i remember in my batch there was nikhil chinappa there was binoy there was um Um, Amrita Arora, there was me, and if I'm not mistaken, there was Kazan, um, or Kazan came later. I'm not too sure. Something like that. And uh, all of us were very Indian, as Indian as you could be. You know, we were all normal uh, kids from normal from from our metro cities. And um, I think what happened at that point of time is because uh, the face of the channel was changing. um the youth of india kind of uh, immediately reacted to all of us 
and uh, you know and we were we were part of that boom that happened with MTV India and MTV music our music also turned to 70% indian uh, music 30% would be western so that was the mix and we all spoke like the next college going student because um, we were all we were all local kids and uh, i have to tell you this that uh, though it was a uh, a uh, a big boom time we all had our place under the sun all of us so amongst us there was no bitchiness there was absolute camaraderie absolute uh, love and respect for what each one of us did we all had the shows that suited us so we were never in competition with one another you know uh, the only thing we were told while we were be- why we were mtv vjs is that we've got to bloody do our best and that's what we did and i think we all kind of flowered um at that point of time and you know we all had our we all became who i think our true self because we were never told to behave in a certain way we were never asked to put on an accent to do anything that was not us so i think uh, that's what made it all so special but i know that today it is far more um uh not i would say there is there is so many people and there's so much of competition that i think today it is very different um but having said that you know um everyone finds their place under the sun and i think you've got to just be true to yourself and you've got to treat everyone um you know with love and respect i feel and i really feel that nobody can take anything away from you that's supposed to be yours you know it will come to you if it's if you deserve to have it and if it may, it's going to make your life a little better how amazing this line is you know that what is meant for you will always come to you it will find its way to you you know so you've also hosted several shows including do it sweet and i love cooking so how do you decide on the themes and content for your shows so i don't actually because uh, today um, at that point of time the content was decided by the channels and then they would approach the host or the chef uh, depending on what kind of look they want so when uh, do it sweet came to me they i was called in as a host and vicky ratnani was doing his first ever food show at that point of time this was his first food show i was the host and uh, when i was called in i was like but i don't know anything about like i don't know much about food they were like no don't worry the chef is there and, you know but it's a first time he's a first time chef so you know um, you will have to kind of uh, steer this show and it was such a pleasure shooting with vicky and i got so interested in all the food that he was making and it was my first introduction to food and how it should be made and how what is what is baking what are the different temperatures and this and that and everything that in a funny way that propelled me to learn food and then of course i went on to do um i love um, i love i love baking i love baking yeah i know I forgot what was the name of the show only. It was called I Love Cooking. Ah, uh, I Love Cooking. Correct. That was I Love Cooking, and there was I Want to Bake Free. So um, they, these are the two shows that I did with um, uh, the channel, and uh, they were both decided because of the kind of food that I made and the kind of. So there was a lot of uh, research that went into what I did, and we all sat together as a team. We decided what we're going to cook. So a lot of that was done much before we. the show went on the on the floor so it was not that i was just cooking randomly just anything but it was stuff that i really like to do what i can do you know because uh, what the audience would also like so it was to do with all of that so um, yeah sometimes sometimes you're part of the planning process sometimes you're gotten and you're just taken in for your expertise it just depends on what the channel wants at that point of time so you've also authored a cookbook tell me the passion for cooking and how it influences your work and you know how did you think of putting all these recipes together i started learning to cook after i had my kids like really seriously learning because i i didn't know how to so i knew maybe 4 to 5 or max 10 even if i push it max 10 things that i knew how to make and uh, when i had my son i realized that i had to make him some kind of food and um, i was basically struggling with okay so how do you make uh, how do you make a soup what do you how do you make a vegetable soup what do you what do you put inside it and how do i make uh, 
uh, khichdi because i never cooked i never ever cooked because i was working for my entire life i worked so i never really got into the kitchen i was not really interested i uh, my mom every time she would tell me why don't you cook i would say you know i'm just going to order out i don't need to learn so <laughs> so i kind of started learning only after my son turned two i think and that i realized that oh my god i need to know how long i should be uh, frying an egg for so that i should not over fry it how much of how much of time do i need to boil a soft boiled egg how much is the, how much longer for a hard boil exactly all these things and in this process i got really interested in the whole um science behind it and so i started doing a lot of reading i started doing a lot of experimenting 2010 i started writing a blog with i would put each and every recipe that i did whether it came out well whether it died whatever happened to it i would write about it onto this blog and i realized while i was writing this blog that there was a lot of stuff that i used to talk about besides the food and uh, then i got about three offers to do a book and i took the third offer actually because by then i was like okay there may be something in this which is why people are approaching me to write a food book of course this took me two and a half years because i did it completely alone i didn't know that there you could have a team and all that kind of stuff so as you you know i was a novice at this and uh, but what i did was i kind of uh, thought that i would just put in all my favorite recipes and uh, since i used to cook for the people that i love i divided the whole book into 12 months and dedicated each month to somebody or to a festival or uh, to a feeling to something like that and then i was able to chart down what i wanted to put in the book and then of course started the process of trying doing trials try it out if it didn't come well then i just i had to discard it and the ones that went forward then i had to kind of do a uh, right um, put the recipe down by the gram and it was quite a long process and uh, i finally did it and they are very simple recipes i did not use a food stylist i used my my clothes stylist who came and styled the table but the food was all from the pan or from the fire straight onto the plate and a photograph taken so it was all fresh food there was no styling done it was left as simple as possible and uh, i wanted it that way because i realized that when i was learning to cook sometimes i would see photographs of food and i would be thinking my food's going to turn out like that and look nothing like that so i was very clear when i did the book that i would present the food exactly as it was cooked rather than do something really fancy to it and put uh, you know put stuff on it that is not edible and just to look nice so i thought i won't do all that i would do away with all that and just present a very simple book that anyone can pick up and there'll be a recipe for everyone in the book how amazing so from a cookbook to poetry i mean you've authored it all wow please tell us a little bit more on your poetry book to the moon and back i love the moon so tell me a little bit i love the moon too mahua completely love it so uh, so while i started writing my blog in 2010 in 2011 onwards i used to be sometimes just penning down rhymes and sometimes i would put them onto my blog sometimes i would not and uh, i realized that there was there was a lot of i would i didn't i i used to just i you know expressions coming out of me i would say i i would i would just sit down and and write words 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 they would just flow out of me and then i would pen it down and then i would um, uh, actually not even pen it down i used to write it all on my phone so both my books i wrote on my on my uh, phone actually because uh, i'm not good at typing on a laptop and i found the phone easily and uh, every time something would come to mind i would just I would just type it onto my phone, and that's how I, I actually wrote both the books. Interrupt here, Maria, because you're the only other human being who I know types on the phone like me. <laughs> <laughs> it's the M thing. It's the M. All the M's are nuts, I think. I'm sure because I've written a whole book on my phone. Yeah, I've written my book of poetry on the phone. My first book was also semi-written oh. on the phone. second book is fully on the phone so yeah my, both my books are on the phone now mm. both of them oh wow <laughs> i feel so good because i've often felt that you know there's something wrong with me you know because the phone is so easy it's so handy and yeah. you know whenever you sit down you can just put that in your notes do you yeah, use notes yeah exactly yes absolutely everything is written on my notes everything <laughs> <laughs> 
This is amazing. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> amazing. So sorry, I had to interrupt. So no, yes. No, no, please. I started writing everything and I had, uh, I think from 2011 to, to I think 2018 or 19 somewhere. I think I must have had about 100 poems that I had penned down uh, or, or typed on my phone. And um, I used to put them out. I used to sometimes not, you know, depending. And then I think I gave it, uh, I asked my um, my publisher, I said, you know, I've written all these poems. Do you want to have a look? So he said, send it over. So I compiled them and I sent them all to my uh, publisher who gave it to the editor, Ipshita, and uh, to Deepa. Um, Deepa was the head editor and she read it and she said, you know, Maria, there is a lot of stuff here, which is really nice, but uh, we're going to have to, we can't publish all of it. I was like, no, 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 not, a, not at all. And then Ipshita, who, who actually is the one who kind of went through the entire lot of it and came down to 70. Then from 70, I think we came to 50. From 50, we came to 40. So somewhere in 2019, I had... Uh, my final 50, I think, that I was thinking that probably this will go in the book. And um, then while we were, while they would give me the book every time to edit, I would edit some more, throw some more out, write some new ones. So during lockdown, I think 50% of the book I read it. Because every time they would send it to me and say, why don't you do a last and final scroll through and, you know, just check everything. I would read it and I'd say, gosh, this is terrible in my head. I would be talking to myself and, and talking to myself and saying, oh, I thought this is horrible. Let me just redo this or let me just. So I just kept editing it till Jan this year. Can you believe this? And uh, finally, my edit, my um, publisher, Ajay, told me, he said, Maria, we are now no longer sending you the book. I said, yes, please don't. Because if you do, then I'm compelled to change something or the other in it. So, um, finally... I get the compulsion. Yeah, yeah. you just keep... Because you read it and then you're like, oh God, this is like you want to puke. <laughs> Reading it. And yeah, and then finally he said, he said, I am not sending it back. I said, please don't. I said, but please read it once so that there are no, uh, you know, errors. There are no spelling mistakes. There is the, the commas. Because, you know, when you start reading your own, you read it with everything in place. So you kind of skip all the mistakes. So yeah. I don't know now. I've not read it. Um, I actually read it once after it came. But um, after that, I haven't read it. I, I'm hoping to get a lot of feedback from people who read it. So some some people do send me feedback. Some people just say, we've got your book. And that's where it ends. So I don't know whether people like it, whether people feel what about it. But I'm happy. I'm happy with the work that I put in. So let me say that. How amazing, Maria. You and me are separated, uh, you know, <laughs> by distance, but we are very alike <laughs> the more I talk to you. So, you know, with the rise of digital media and all these streaming platforms, I mean, my God, I'm myself like completely trying to get my head around it. How do you think the role of TV and traditional media is changing? Oh, it has changed completely, I feel. I feel today on television, if you, I'm, I'm talking of if you don't have... Um, you know, the right kind of shows or the kind of shows that are interesting to watch. Um, nobody's watching them anymore because uh, today everything is digital and everything is online. So um, it's like the best travel shows you watch on Insta because everybody is an influencer and everybody is traveling to places. Everybody is eating the most amazing food and living the most fantastic life on Insta. So you get to see that. You get to see some of the best shows um uh, on all these digital platforms. So I would say television per se has taken a huge beating. You know, uh, I think it's mostly used to watch uh, sports. I think um, cricket is still watched on Doordarshan because I think they have, um, they still have, um, you know, rights over it. But uh, I think uh, IPL has been taken over by all the digital houses. So it's it's completely different today. You don't need a television if you have your phone or you have your laptop. You know, you can watch it anywhere. You've been an inspiration to many, you know, with your positive outlook and your cheerful personality. I mean, I love watching you. How do you stay so motivated and upbeat even during tough times? It isn't easy, I'm sure, you know. No, it isn't. It isn't. I am of the opinion that 
everything is going to work out for the best. You know, I, no matter what I'm going through, I feel that this is going to turn around. This is going to get better. And uh, there must be a reason why uh, I'm going through a low or I'm going through um, something that's not feeling too good in my heart. And I feel that, uh, no, this, this is happening because there's something better waiting around the corner. And I need to learn a lesson from this, probably that I haven't learned really well. And uh, it's all going to get fine. And I think uh, that's what keeps me, that's what keeps me going. That's what keeps me fine. That's what, that's what I truly believe. I feel that um, there is this pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And there is a silver lining to every dark cloud. How amazing. Can you just share with us any of your upcoming projects or ventures that, you know, you're really excited about and you're looking forward to it? So, uh, to be very, very truthful, Mahua, I don't have any upcoming projects. Uh, I did I did uh, three pieces of work in 2020-21, uh, two of which uh, released. One, I was part of, uh, I did a cameo for in Masaba Masaba. And it was a very, very fun cameo of this uh, drunk mother of the bride. So I enjoyed it thoroughly and I had great fun playing it. One was I had to play Chef Maria in Mind the Malhotras and I that has already released. Uh, there's another piece of work that I did with uh, Endemol and uh, that should release somewhere this year. It's called Breaking News and uh, it's a very serious role again. Not again, but that's the first serious role I've done. The other two were a lark. So this is what I have uh, in the pipeline. Other than this, um, I am actually trying to start work on my third book, which is East Indian Cuisine. It's something that is very close to my heart since I'm an East Indian. East Indians uh, come from the seven islands of Mumbai. Uh, we are the local inhabitants of uh, Maharashtra. And uh, we are um, the people of Bombay. We are the original inhabitants of Bombay, erstwhile Bombay. And, um, you know, East Indians were farmers, they were fisher folk, and they were landowners. And uh, there's a lot of Portuguese influence in our food. There is a lot of uh, um, um, British influence in our food because we took our name after the British East India Company to appease uh, Queen Victoria, when she was visiting, to separate separate us from the West Indi West Indians, who were the West, Indi which was also a colony of the British. So I'm sure my forefathers uh, were converts, and uh, here I am today, Maria Goretti, and uh, making East Indian food and cooking up a storm and writing poetry on the side and doing some kind of drama bars always. <laughs> <laughs> it was absolutely fabulous talking to you, Maria. You got my heart. So before I end this episode, I have to share a recipe, which is from your March menu, uh, oh. you know, from my kitchen to yours. You know, the palak spinach soup, which Papaya had, and I also try and cook and very few people oh. can get it right. So oil a little, butter a little more, garlic, four cloves, <laughs> onion, two medium, finely chopped, potato, one cubed, Vegetable stock, 2 cups. Tomato, 2 cubed. Spinach, 150 grams. Milk, 1 cup. Salt and pepper to taste. Nutmeg. I have to tell you this now. So a lot of people wrote back to me saying you cannot mix palak with milk. So if you want to take the milk out and you want to add coconut milk to it, please do. But dairy is supposedly not added with palak. This I got to know because I recently posted it and a lot of people wrote back to me saying you never mix milk with palak. So if you want to just correct that and you want to give it as a different, I mean, with the coconut milk in, it would still taste as yum. Coconut milk would make it even more tastier. If you don't want the consistency to be watery, add another cup of vegetable stock and you can ditch the milk. And if you want it to be a way more tastier soup, then add what Maria just now said, coconut milk to this recipe. Thank you so much, Maria. Look forward to meeting you in person and I shall be sending you my book. Thank you so much for being on today's episode. Thank you, Mawa. Thank you for having me on your show. It's a pleasure talking to you and I really do hope I get to meet you. Yes, I look forward to meeting you too. To you, our dearest listeners, you can find us on your favourite streaming services, 
Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcast, and of course on all other major streaming services. With loads of love, we are the Mohua Show, where we talk imandari se. <laughs>